very honored to be introducing Mary Poppendick. I'm Lucio Lopez. I'm the responsible of Agile in Santander, Mexico. And well, for me, it's really a honor to introduce Mary. She's the author of Lean Software Development. She has been in the information technology industry for over 40 years. She has managed software development, supply chain management, manufacturing operations, new product development. She's really a popular writer and speaker. It's the co-author of four books, Lean Software Development, Implementing Lean Software Development, Leading Lean Software Development, and of course, Lean Mindset. So please, Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I have to share my screen, huh? And then I have to go over here and do a few things. Here we go. Okay. So today I would like to talk about too much of a good thing. Uh, here's a massive snowstorm and you know, snow is beautiful, but every so often you can get too much and it can bury the cars. So uh, almost everything that's good, you can have too much of. In fact, if you take a look at this, um, there is a paper that was published in 2011 on, in Perspectives on Psychological Science. It is called Too Much of a Good Thing, The Challenge and Opportunity of the Inverted U. Now, if you look at that bridge in Venice, uh, it's an inverted U. So the inverted U is oftentimes called the bridge curve because it looks like at least this kind of a bridge. There are uh, other kinds of curves. So for example, there's a monotonic curve, which means uh, it's constantly and steadily increasing and going up and up and up. And uh, you can't get too much of being good. You just get better performance and, and whatever the good thing is. And then there's the plateau, which means you get better at something and after a while, the impact of getting better and better isn't so much, it kind of flattens out. But the inverted U is different. It means that after a while you can do too much and you can actually have lower performance if you have too much of a good thing. Um, so I want to ask which curves apply to some of the things that we kind of think about when we're doing agile, like autonomy, is that good? Can you have too much of it? Or communication, can there be too much communication? What about efficiency? Everybody wants to be efficient, can you be too efficient? Uh, what about consensus, everybody agreeing on everything? Can you have too much of that? So let's start out with, can there be too much autonomy? Now, anybody who has a two-year-old child, this is our daughter when she was two years old, knows that there's a certain point at which you don't want two-year-olds to have too much autonomy. But it happens also with software. So if you... Alignment and autonomy may seem like different ends of a scale, as in more autonomy equals less alignment. However, we think of it more like two different dimensions. Down here is low alignment and low autonomy. A micromanagement culture, no high level purpose, just shut up and follow orders. Up here is high alignment, but still low autonomy. So leaders are good at communicating what problem needs to be solved, but they are also telling people how to solve it. High alignment and high autonomy means leaders focus on what problem to solve, but let the teams figure out how to solve it. What about down here then? Low alignment and high autonomy means teams do whatever they want and basically all run in different directions. Leaders are helpless and our product becomes a Frankenstein. So if you think about that, that's thanks to my friend, Henrik Nieberg, and that's from his classic video about engineering uh, at, at Spotify. So clearly there's a time in which there can be too much autonomy when teams just go running off in different directions. Or with the same amount of autonomy, there can also be alignment and maybe you get some better results. So let's take a look at SpaceX, which I think put up another Falcon rocket yesterday. This is 
the first launch of Falcon Heavy in February 6, I believe, 2018. Um, and it was just amazing. You could see two of these booster, these booster rockets landing right at Cape Canaveral after the launch. SpaceX, if you think about that rocket, that's like a computer being, <laughs> it's like a computer. Almost everything is computer controlled. And um, that is a bunch of teams that get stuff together. And whenever there's a launch date, everybody has to be ready for the launch to make sure that the launch works, not to make sure that their part works, but to make sure the whole thing works. So if you take a look at the line from control to autonomy, where do you balance out? And I propose that you balance out at what's called responsibility. That's basically the way SpaceX runs its engineering and software development. This is John Muratori, who is their launch director. And uh, in a talk that he gave in 2012 on systems engineering, he said that um, SpaceX operates on the philosophy of responsibility because no engineering process in existence can replace the philosophy of responsibility for getting things done right and efficiently. Uh, what is the philosophy of responsibility? That means that engineers are responsible for the design and development of a component, that's the responsibility, but they're also responsible for ensuring that their component operates properly and does its job as part of the overall system. So they have to understand their role in the whole system and accomplish not just their own personal component role, but their role in the system. And that's how it works. And now I'm going to go on to the next question. Can there be too much communication? Um, so communication is at one end of the scale and not talking to anybody is at the other end of the scale. And again, where's the sweet spot? Back in our year 2000, when Amazon had a great big mainframe that was dying every holiday season, the, the leaders got together and had a talk and uh, had a meeting and they finally decided what we need is better communication. And that's what they told Jeff Bezos who said, uh-uh, communication is terrible because he knew that he wanted the company to grow really large and communication was not the way to solve problems because you can't get really, really large and still expect everybody to be able to talk. Instead, he said, we should have teams that are no bigger than a number that can be fed with two pizzas at lunch. And if you can feed a team with two pizzas, that's the right size. And teams should not be any bigger than that, which is really interesting. So what's the sweet spot here is a structure which allows independent decision making and independent responsibility of teams. Because as he saw it, communication was a limit to growth. In fact, he said serious scale, really big scale, requires a whole lot of agents making independent decisions. So he structures, and if you think about AWS, they are structured this way, with two pizza teams, and they were designed to dramatically reduce the need for communication and enable growth. They have six to 12 people, and including a leader who is a responsible person and acts like a CEO. And teams are separable. They can operate independently, and they single-threaded, that is, they work on a single thing at a time. And they're responsible for a set of measurable external outcomes focused on customers. Um, and that's the responsibility part. They decide what they will work on, how they're going to do the work. And the dependencies between teams are kept to an absolute minimum. So if you think about how Conway's law brought us the cloud, Conway's law says. If we think about how the law of Conway works, Dice que si tienes una estructura organizativa, la estructura del software va a encajar básicamente con este sistema. Y tenían equipos autónomos, estos equipos de pizza, y por lo tanto tenían que ver servicios autónomos, que significaba un despliegue independiente. Y el independiente, independiente era bastante novedoso entonces. Había mucho estrés came up with an idea. Área de operaciones. Así que el vicepresidente de infraestructuras, Chris Pinkham, tuvo una idea. 
dijo, vamos a tener un despliegue de autoservicio, vamos a dar a los equipos responsabilidad sobre la producción, porque eh, qué tal hacer que uh, las operaciones sean la responsabilidad de los propios equipos. Es un concepto de responsabilidad de nuevo. Y si uh, lo podemos hacer, tal vez podamos vender la capacidad. Bueno, pasó el tiempo y uh, se uh, mudó a Sudáfrica. Hello. And he was asked to pursue a project there. And he assembled and led a team and developed uh, EC2. It took a couple of years. And in 2006, EC2 launched. And the rest is history. That's the beginning of Amazon Web Services. And it pretty much is because they had less communication and they could actually operate through, the, the, uh, um, through their service boundaries they were able to grow really large. So let's go on to the next one, efficiency. Is it possible to have too much efficiency? Well, actually, um, there is a place where you use, you have lots of duplication and, and excessive use of stuff. And then there's an end where you're efficient. But during the pandemic, what we saw was efficient supply chain, which basically collapsed. Uh, you know, there were lots of things that we couldn't get. In fact, in our country, one of the things we could not get was flour because all of the flour was uh, packaged half in 50 pound bags for commercial bakeries, half in five pound bags for home use. And everybody started wanting flour at home. There was plenty of flour, but there wasn't enough packaging material to package it all in five or 10 pound bags. And so suddenly there was a massive shortage of flour. And there were other uh, uh, shortages too, because right in the middle between assess, excessive stuff and efficient use of resources is resilience. Stuff that doesn't collapse when something strange happens. So here's why supply chains break. Either the demand changes faster than the time in the supply chain, or the demand exceeds the capacity at some link in the ship supply chain. So if you look at um, during the pandemic, durable goods supply chains, um, even bicycles became hard to get, but especially like appliances, they are slow and unresponsive. Why? Because it's a very long supply chain. This stuff is made in one country, it goes into a container, it goes on a ship and eventually arrives somewhere else. And the demand during the pandemic changed basically in a week. And that was much faster than the supply chain. Perishable goods supply chains like meat and vegetables, they are much faster, much more responsive. And they can change as fast as uh, the week that it took for us to change. If you look at the demand exceeding capacity at a link in the supply chain, for example, in flour, there was plenty of flour, plenty of mill capacity, plenty of grain, but not enough packaging material. Resilient supply chains have redundancy or slack at every single step. There is another place to go. This is actually true of software architectures too. Resilient software architectures have redundancy at every, ooh, every spot. And loose coupling in a supply chain allows a rapid reconfiguration. So if one spot in the supply chain collapses, it can be You can configure the supply chain around that and do a lot uh, and, and move goods. But let's go back to this perishable goods supply chain. So a perishable goods supply chain does not optimize for resource efficiency. It optimizes for speed because if you have fruits and vegetables like that, you want to get them to the people who are going to eat them as fast as possible. You would never optimize, take a look at this person taking all of her vegetables on a bike to the market. Well, you know what? Why shouldn't, wouldn't it be more efficient if there was a truck in the fields and they put all their stuff in the truck and eventually the truck drove it all to the market and then you wouldn't have all these individual little bikes going. You would have just one driver and one truck. But the problem is that it wouldn't get to the market while the vegetables were still fresh. So it doesn't make any sense to worry about whether or not we're efficiently using resources 
Uh, it doesn't make any sense. What we really want is to get that milk or that meat or those vegetables as fast as we can to the people who are going to eat them. So you would never accumulate large batches in the truck and still expect fresh stuff. Small batches just plain move faster. And so if you have a perishable goods supply chain, you think about discovering and eliminating the biggest bottleneck and then you do it again and again and again. And you figure out what you sell, the consumption, and that pulls the replenishment through a really short, fast supply chain. And you take the consumer feedback of how much is purchased. Do they purchase a lot of raspberries? We're gonna plant more raspberries next year. Do they not purchase as much melons? Okay, let's not grow so many melons. So if you think about software delivery as a perishable goods supply chain, you don't optimize for efficiency. You optimize for speed, and that's a really different thing. And it gives you much more resilience. Now let's go to the very last one. And that is consensus, okay? Can we have too much consensus? Well, let's think about that. Um, at one end of the scale is conflict, which is bad, right? And at the other end of the scale is consensus. And many times in Agile, we think, how can we make sure that we have plenty of consensus? Everybody agrees. But you know what? Even that is a uh, uh, inverted U. If you think about Toyota, once upon a time, I studied a lot of them. And one of their theories was great conflict makes great cars. That's interesting. Why would you want conflict in order to make something great? Well, you want conflict because um, innovation comes when there are brand new ideas because the old ideas don't work. And that comes when you need to make trade-offs that are not one way, not the other way, but some sort of marriage of the different values of what different people would like. So Toyota likes to have on a team people who are going to disagree. People are going to have arguments people who are then going to find a good solution that solves all of the problems. So this is a really great book and I strongly recommend it to you. It's about creating great choices. And it's by um, Jennifer Ryle and Roger Martin. Roger Martin is from Toronto and a really amazing economist. I love everything he writes. So I read this book and the interesting thing he said is when you're making a trade-off, you do not ask the, the hippo, the highest paid person in the organization or the product owner or the expert. You don't ask those people. You don't compromise. If you have two people that have completely different ideas, halfway in between is gonna be a mediocre. You have to think something different. And for sure you don't vote and then take the majority opinion because that doesn't integrate all of the ideas, and that's where innovation comes from. Instead, you should do this. You take and look at two completely opposite positions and you extract the essential benefits from each one of those totally opposing points of view. What's good about it, okay? You take a look at each side and say, what's good about it? And then you figure out a way to achieve all the good on both sides. That's integrative thinking. So let's take a look at about 2000. And there were two schools of thought about how to do software. There was plan the work and work the plan, have, have great structure, make sure your process is repeatable. And then there was the embrace change. We need to do stuff fast. Now, if you look at the old way, which we sometimes called the waterfall way, had some interesting benefits. It was predictable. It managed risk. You could monitor progress, maybe towards the wrong end, but you could monitor it. And everybody knew what they were supposed to do. And you had, at least in theory, safe and secure deployment. And when you had the change, you weren't gonna get any of those things. On the other hand, the good part about Agile was that it was speed, it was fast, it was adaptable. You could typically get stuff with higher value at lower cost. 
you created challenging, engaging work for people. And most importantly, you ended up with the right thing. So how do you do those two things? So embrace changes like uh, that was the subtitle of Ken Beck's book on XP. And those things seem diametrically opposed. But agile, if you do agile right, you get all of those benefits. You get all the predictability and risk management and progress monitoring and people knowing what to do and safe, secure deployment from the traditional way. And you also get all the speed and adaptability and lower cost and higher value and challenging, engaging work and the right thing that you get from the the new way of doing things, if you do Agile right. So what does that mean to do Agile right? Well, one thing for sure that it means is that you have a continuous delivery pipeline. Um, if you take a look at that, what you're doing is a lot of small releases. You plan, you do some coding, you build, you test, you release it, you deploy it, you figure out what things need, you monitor it, and then you go around and you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it very rapidly. In fact, if you are um, in an online type service, hopefully you're doing it multiple times a day. But in any case, you're going through this loop very, very quickly. Um, and that continuous delivery pipeline gives you the feedback to give you most of those benefits that I listed on the, on the page before. The other half of Agile done right is fully responsible teams. And I've actually mentioned this a few times, and that is that responsibility is sort of the kind of sweet spot. So what we're looking for here is small multidiscipline teams, lots of people, everyone involved in delighting customers, everybody. All the different people need to be on a team, on a small team, so it needs to be a small piece of work. There needs to be clear goals, clear definition of the expected outcomes or the desired outcomes, and clear definition of what are the constraints. If there's a time constraint, it's clear. If there's a uh, budget constraint, it's clear. Um, That's not saying how to deal with the constraint, but it's clear what's there. And then the team has the freedom to act. And they can act without coordinating with other teams and without permission, not just without permission from management, but also without permission from the other teams, which means they have to be able to deploy independently. They teams are responsible for building the right things without any intermediaries between the team and the the people who are going to use their, their, the thing that they're making. Without intermediaries means without, quote unquote, the business in between, without the product owner in between, without anybody in between the team and the, uh, the customers that they're trying to, trying to please. So that's the area of responsibility. And they frequently deliver to the market. Uh, in this really nice book, Sense and Respond, uh, Jeff and Josh talk about how to learn your way forward by maintaining a continuous two-way conversation with the market. And in uh, even if you look at SpaceX when they launch, they did their learning in about three-month chunks where they had launch after launch after launch, testing one thing after another. They learned their way forward, even with great big hardware projects like that. And success is consumer outcomes, not output, not proxies. Not intermediaries, not proxy metrics, but the thing that the consumers wanted, did we accomplish it? And when you have those two things, fully responsible teams and continuous delivery, then that's pretty much agile done right. So with that, I would like to say thank you. And I think we have five minutes for questions. Hello, Thank you very much, Mary. Hello. Let's wait to see if they have some questions in here. Ah. In the chat or <laughs> however, I don't have anything yet. Okay. 
الانتخاب I don't know if you've ever had that much snow where you see in the picture in the upper right hand corner that hump that's a car buried wow. with snow that's my granddaughter snow was up to her shoulders or her head actually that was the biggest snowstorm took him a while to get out of it and she has too much autonomy <laughs> Yeah, well, they have a picture of her crawling over to the na neighbor's house on the top of the snow. So <laughs> and she, was, she was pretty well confined by the snow and comes right down to it. Okay. Well, since there aren't any questions, I guess I will say goodbye then. What is that? How does that sound? Do you have any questions, Lucia? Uh, well, probably some of them pop in my mind. For example, you were talking about continuous delivery. So again, taking all the the theme of the presentation, you think it can be too much continuous? I mean, uh, how yes. how much is too much for having this uh, continuous delivery? Uh, we heard sometimes that some big techs are delivering uh, several times a day or several times an hour. Right. But, uh, we, sometimes we as a bank think that could be uh, kind of dangerous or kind of, uh, I don't know, how, how much is too much for continuous delivery? So that's domain dependent. So if you take a look at SpaceX, for them, continuous delivery was launching a rocket every three months, which was massively fast, okay? Um, for a bank, I think there's different parts of the bank where continuous delivery of apps on the customer side could be very possible, but continuous delivery of changes in the back end, probably not. Um, there has to be well-tested changes in, in certain areas, and then there has to be much faster changes where consumers are. So I think you have to figure out it, you can have too much of anything that's good. In fact, too much speed. You can confuse customers, if you constantly change your website, you can have a speed that's too fast for the context. So I don't think you can say just because somebody like Amazon delivers new stuff to the market every 11 seconds, that that's what you ought to be doing. Because you're in a different world with different constraints and different customers. But the fact that it's possible and that you have a chain that allows very rapid customer feedback on your changes is definitely good. The question is, where's the balance in your, in your context? Okay. Very, very Aristotelic uh, point of view from, for all, for all the things that suddenly we think that we should go all the way through them and maybe that's not the right way sometimes, but having the ability to do it, it's good enough. I think we don't have questions or okay. more questions for here so i think we can they can go have lunch and we can go back right so thank you it was really an honor to talk with you mary it was i enjoyed a lot this chat <laughs> thank you very much bye <laughs>